Nate Hagens is a recovering hedge fund manager, <laughs> among many other things. He saw the light, left the belly of the beast, went and got his PhD at the University of Vermont at the Gunn School, I suppose. Yeah. Um, he, and uh, he's the former lead editor of the late lamented website, The Oil Drum, if any of you are familiar with that on energy topics and everything related, which means just about everything. Uh, he's on the boards of the Post Carbon Institute and a variety of other groups and is co-founder of the Bottleneck Foundation. He currently teaches human ecology at the University of Minnesota. Please welcome Nate Hagens. Thank you. Um, so this is the first presentation I've ever given where my slide deck had to be in five days ago. So what you're about to see is where my thinking was last Wednesday. <laughs> um, so I used to manage money for billionaires. Basically, it was my job. And so I studied the human macroeconomy, which was I all cared about where stocks and bonds and commodities were going. And as um, Tom said, I left. And now I'm studying human macroecology, how the whole system of humans and our human ecosystem fits together. And I believe that unless we understand all major aspects of the system, we don't really have a coherent uh, piece of view of what's going on. Today I'm going to talk about energy, uh, but energy, money, the relationship between the two, and also, uh, I'm not going to talk about human behavior or the environment, but those are also uh, very relevant pieces. So energy. The trophic period, uh, pyra pyramid in nature is such that energy underpins everything. Um, there is uh, a, a heat loss um, when the sun hits uh, uh, the grasses. There's another one when the herbivores eat the grass, and then there's another one when the lion eats the herbivores, et cetera. But underpinning everything is energy, up the trophic pyramid. The same thing happens in human systems. Our primary capital, our primary wealth, is um, natural ecosystems, forests, trees, rivers. And in this picture, there's um, fossil fuels underpinning uh, goods and services in the human system. We turn primary energy into uh, secondary capital, um, like tractors and toasters and buildings and computers and services. And then we've got um, financial tertiary markers that represent all this stuff lower in the pyramid. So one thing that's not conventionally understood in economics textbooks is that we need energy as a precursor for every single thing that adds up to GDP in our economies. No matter how you might make a cup, you first need an energy precursor, whether it's made from coconut or ceramic or glass. You absolutely first need energy. So if you think about me, I'm about one-tenth of a horse. That's my horse, which is one horse. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my vehicle, uh, um, UTV, which is 45 horsepower, and my truck, which is 150 horsepower, all this is powered by the unbelievably energy-dense fuels in oil. So this amount of gasoline will power that truck a couple miles up and down snow, icy, hilly roads. And we take that for granted, the amazing power in this ancient sunlight. This is Diet Coke, but. Um. <laughs> OK, so standard economic textbooks treat energy as the same as any other commodity. You look at all the things on this uh, uh, graph, they're all cost about $60. Sunglass, well, $100 bill, uh, tequila, a coffee maker, sushi, some boots. But in our economic system, they're all treated as equal in something called the Cobb-Douglas function, which shows that GDP is created from technology and labor. Energy is not involved. Energy is just outside of the system, and yet energy underpins everything that we do. One barrel of oil, and if you forget everything that I'm going to say in my talk, if you remember this, it's an important point. One barrel of oil has 5.7 million BTUs worth of energy. That translates to 1,750 kilowatt hours of human labor. That means Tom or I digging ditches or 
putting up roofing or carrying wheelbarrow loads of stuff, we can do six tenths of one kilowatt hour in one day of work, a nine hour day. So one barrel of oil substitutes 10 to 11 years of human labor. The average American salary is $45,000. So there's $500,000 of labor is substituted from one barrel. So if we look at the average number of the cost in the left column, the cost to generate one kilowatt hour of work for an average human is 200, average American is $260, okay? Versus gasoline at $2 a gallon is five cents. So this story of how our, our coworkers in our society are made from fossil carbon is largely one that is not recognized. So this amazing energy subsidy that we get from coal, oil, and natural gas, not talking about externalities yet, really is the story of higher wages, higher profits, lower price stuff, and a dramatic increase in population the last couple hundred years. So if we think about the direct solar inputs to the human economy and all of the 4 billion people in the labor force worldwide, that adds up to around 11% of the work done in the world. 90% of the work done in our economies is done from coal, oil, and natural gas. Billions and billions and billions of extra coworkers standing behind us that we don't even acknowledge because they're so inexpensive. So um, this was a graph from a presentation last week from the Bank of England that showed global GDP per capita for the last um, 3,000 years. And it's online, you could find it. Um, there was a 30 page word by word transcript of the, the governor's uh, speech. He never once mentioned the word energy, not in 30 pages, to describe how our civilization has, has accomplished this, never once mentioned. So really, when we think about um, industrialization, what we're talking about is adding huge amounts of fossil energy in an energy inefficient way to replace things that humans used to do. A real simple example is, depending on the boundaries of the analysis, we might um, have 100 times more energy in a car than just walking, but the car gets us there five to eight times faster. So here's another example. Um, I'm from Wisconsin, so here's a milking example. There's manual milkers where there's no energy required other than the human input, which requires 30 minutes per cow per day. Then there's the semi-automated machine, which is 15 minutes per cow um, per day, and 300 kilowatt hours per cow of external energy is needed per year. But that raises the wages to $5 an hour. And then we have these fully automated milking machines, um, which reduces the human input to only three minutes per cow per day, a lot more energy, and it raises the wages to $15 an hour, or it increases the corporate profits of the milk owner, or it reduces the price of milk to something that people can afford. All because we added a lot more energy to a process that humans used to do. But what happens, and pay attention to the red line, um, the bottom axis is the more units of mechanical energy we add to a process, and the left graph, the, the, the left axis, is wages. The more units that we add, the higher the wage gets. Until, if you look at the blue line, when we go from five cents a kilowatt hour to 15 cents a kilowatt hour, at some point, because we're adding so many units of energy, then this higher cost energy causes this little profit um, arrangement to break down. I'm gonna skip this next graph. Um, because when I s s made this last Wednesday, I was told I had 25 minutes, so I, I gotta go fast. Um, so in nature, there's something called optimal foraging theory, which is in ecology and biology, where they study how much energy an animal exerts to get their prey versus how much energy is in the prey itself. There's no dollars involved in that. It's a strictly biophysical arrangement. And if a cheetah chased mice all day, it might be incredibly successful, but there's not enough calories in the mouse to power the energy input required. Well, the same thing happens in the human sphere. We have found the super high quality fossil sunlight 
long ago. There's still plenty of it out there, but it's much more costly and much more dirty. Um, so it used to be uh, when we found oil in the 1910s or 1920s, we would take one unit of energy and we would find 1,000 or 1,200 units of energy somewhere. And now the ratio is you know, underneath 10. We're spending a lot of energy just to find where the energy is. So this is kind of a best first story. And the other thing is the price of oil, right? In economics, over time, the theory is that things get cheaper and cheaper over time because we get smarter, we outsource to the um, lowest cost areas, and like a toaster. Toasters kind of eventually, asymptotically, we figured out how to make them the cheapest. Economists assume the same as for energy, that will eventually, the same sort of thing, but it follows the red curve, more like a bathtub. Things get more expensive eventually after we've used the, the super good low entropy stuff and have to go to the the lower quality stuff. So when you think about the price of oil, there's really at least three prices, right? There's the price at the pump. There's the price, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, of what the fossil fuel companies have to pay to, to do the work and effort of finding it and extracting it. And then there's the true cost, which includes the externalities you know, of CO2 or pollution or, or, or things like that. But most people are only focused at the price at the pump. And right now, it seems like, hey, it's pretty good. Um, okay, so real quickly, how does technology relate to energy? Well, there's four types of technology. The first type is where we do things to replace what humans used to do with vast amounts of energy, like driving or cutting the lawn or things like that, or buying a refrigerator. Um, we also have new resource conversions like Facebook or iPad or, or technology, things like that, that do things that humans never did before, and they're new ways for us to get brain-pleasing brain chemicals, basically. And those, are, those two types of technology are the vast majority of the story. Of course, we can make coal plants more efficient, or we can invent new solar panels, or we can find new energy technology, new ways to fracture gas and oil. But I would argue that the vast majority of our technology, uh, on the left two thing, end up widening the human energy spigot worldwide on how much primary energy we need. And this is a, a graph of the last 200 years of global energy consumption. And the beige area on the bottom is <coughs> biomass. And the reason we found coal is because they were running out of trees in England and they needed a, a new source. So uh, he mentioned I studied in Vermont. In Vermont, in the 1850s, it was per virtually clear cut. There were no forests there except on the mountains where they couldn't get to. And then we found um, coal, and then the green, which is oil, and the red is natural gas. And you can see that this is a complete widening of our primary energy inputs, which is why a lot of economists don't understand the preciousness of energy, because it's always been increasing, uh, or at least the last couple generations. But we can't understand energy if we don't understand money. So I'm going to talk briefly about money. What is money? I would argue that if we understand that energy underpins human systems, that money is a claim on energy and other non-renewable resources. So this is what we're taught in the textbooks, that money comes in via the fractional reserve banking system and kind of ripples through the system, and that banks are just intermediaries. This is, and I have an MBA from the University of Chicago. We were never taught this. This is wrong. This is not how things work. The truth is that 95% of our money comes from commercial banks. It is created out of thin air. The loan and the deposit are created simultaneously. And the trick is that if Tom gets a loan for $500,000 for his business, that's OK. He's credit worthy, good guy. He looks like Mr. Burns on The Simpsons. Um, and, and so what happens is that $500,000 of, of, of credit goes to his account. Nowhere else in the world did $500,000 of purchasing, purchasing power leave. And most of us don't think about that. So what's happened is we have grown our debt or our credit in the government, individuals, corporations, household municipalities more than we've grown our GDP in every single year since 1965. So that's the left graph. The right graph then, debt does not have to be a bad thing because if you 
borrow a million dollars and then can generate more than a million dollars in the future, it can be a good thing. But what ends up happening is debt productivity, which is how much GDP we're getting for each additional new dollar of debt, has been declining and declining and declining. That's the graph. And once we get down to zero, where we add a trillion dollars just to keep GDP flat, well, then what we're doing is we're transmuting wealth into income. We're not at that point yet, but this has kind of been the trend of things. So since 2000, we've grown the world economy by $16 trillion from 41 to 57. We've grown our global debt from, uh, I'm missing a number on there, but we've, we've increased it to 112 trillion, okay? So what's the carbon footprint of all this central bank, um, what, what they're doing? So I would argue that you can view the situation that we have this low quality energy that really underpins our society, which is the white line, and over time it, it must decline because we're using the really good stuff. At the same time, we're creating money out of thin air, and I don't know where these graphs intersect. I would argue in the 1970s. We needed money in this country in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s because we had so much wide open space and land and tons of fossil fuels and technology and ideas. We had a shortage of money. We had to put money into the system. But now what we're doing is we have declining benefits from the fossil fuels, and so we're papering that over by creating money from thin air. It's not just us now, it's the central banks that are doing it. Okay, so um, a synthesis and then a conclusion. So what is the human ecosystem? I would argue that we turn energy and non renewable resources into dollars, we turn dollars into neurotransmitters and feelings plus waste. This is what we do now, this is what we've always done, and this is what we always will do. The key is to kind of minimize the energy and resource part, maximize the dollar and feeling part, which is another conversation, and minimize the waste. So if we think about the human trophic pyramid, at the dawn of the agricultural revolution around 10,000 years ago, what we were doing was we were optimizing surplus. We were optimizing how much grain and things that the society could produce. But what's happened now with all this debt and central bank things and globalization is we're optimizing surplus value. We're optimizing the top of the pyramid, which is financial markers. And we've lost about a third of our, our you know, it's debatable how much, but we've used a lot of our low uh, entropy uh, fossil fuels and forests and other things. We've expanded our services component of our economy and shrunk the manufacturing production part of the economy. Uh, last month, the ratio of bartenders and waitresses to manufacturing jobs, the gap hit an all-time low. It's like a 3% differential now. And we've expanded the, um, the financial claims on the future with Wall Street and, 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 and et cetera. So if you think about how fossil fuels have subsidized our wages and our profits, et cetera, there's another dark side to that, which is in economic tough times when you're trying to optimize dollars, it makes sense for the owners of the capital to hire these unbelievably cheap fossil slaves instead of real people. And so you see real wages are kind of the, the beige, or the light gray line. Real wages peaked in the 1970s whereas productivity has continued higher. And that's because we've diverted a lot of you know, mechanization because it's so unbelievably cheap. Um, I'm gonna skip that. So, um, so for most people, believe it or not, growth is already over. In, in America, if you look at the, uh, the dark blue line, that's the, the, the top 5% of society. And the lower, the lower blue line is the lowest 20%. So this is the um, percent of income versus 10 years ago um, uh, after, uh, after inflation. So for only 5% of Americans, are they making a higher income, inflation adjusted, than a decade ago? For most people, growth has already ended. We're, we're kind of living uh, what, what, I've been, what I've been talking about. So the story is that our fossil co-workers are such a dominant force of our economy. They ripple through everything because we add so many of their units to every process that we do. They're asking for a pay raise. 
And that has enormous implications, not to mention that we're discovering that they poop and they breathe, which are other concerns, but the pay raise, the pay raise is what I'm talking about today. So most people in the world, if you look at the blue line, that's the interest rate of the 10-year note, and the red line is a very conservative, I would add, um, graph of the extraction cost it takes oil companies to extract a barrel of oil. The right scale is a little cut off, but it's around, the, the, the average, now it's about 60 to $70 is what it takes them to break even. So all of our decision makers, all of our government policy people are focused on the 10-year interest rate as the signal for what we need to do when our real cost of capital, which is energy, is increasing. So this picture was taken last month. This is the world's financial ministers and, uh, and central bankers. And I'm just relatively confident because of who I've been talking to the last six or seven years. They're not talking about energy. They're talking about growth and dollars. Um, so this is a, a graph from the Congressional Budget Office showing uh, actual growth uh, the last six or seven years and then projected growth into the next 10 years. There is no policymaking body in the entire world that does not forecast two or three percent or higher growth into the future. There is no policy body that has flat or declining growth. And I would add here that the important thing to consider is we burn energy and that throws off things that result in GDP. And so GDP can continue going. I don't know for how much longer, but a little bit longer, we'll have higher GDP, but it's the benefits that it throws off to society. The number of, I mean, the bottom 40% of Americans are, are pretty much broke. And there's like 53% of Americans have less than three months wages saved in case they lost their job and then they have nothing. And this is, you know, our stock market's high. There's a lot of very rich people, but the middle class and below are being hollowed out. And this is a major, major implication in the coming years. I'm gonna skip that. So what happens as energy cost of extraction increase? Well, one thing is more poor people, which I just mentioned. Another thing is that really energy intensive processes, and I could name aluminum smelting, um, international air travel with not full planes, uh, cement manufacturing, things that use thousands of units of energy to replace what humans used to do. Those things, for example, the auto, fully automated milking, machine, the economics don't make sense then if energy is so much more expensive. Now, it doesn't seem like that's a problem right now because oil is 50 some dollars, but I think that's probably temporary. Um, okay, so nearing the conclusion, I can envision four types of quadrants in the future. One is we develop some sort of low cost, and I mean low cost, not relative to today, but low cost energy along the lines of what we needed in the 70s, 80s, and 90s as we were building this trajectory, and that we have, it's low carbon and low pollution and whatever. Most people are in that quadrant one. Quadrant two is that we continue to grow, but we use dirty and dirtier sources, and we have a lot of environmental damage. Quadrant three is less growth, and we keep the, the externalities and, and human fabric, social fabric together, and then quadrant four is like Mad Max. And I would say that um, no, very few people are focused on quadrant three. And I would say that the people that are super optimistic don't think we have a problem and they're not gonna accomplish much. The people that are in Mad Max, super pessimistic, also are not gonna really help our situation much. So I would advocate that we need some mildly optimistic and mildly pessimistic people in order to accomplish things. Um, so, summary, energy is what we have to budget and spend. Money is just a marker for energy and primary capital. Fossil fuels have been so cheap that we replaced many tasks humans used to do and made enormous profits, uh, wages, and cheap priced goods. Number three, fossil extraction costs are going up. So wages, profits going down and prices up. For most people, growth is already over. Everything we do will become more expensive over time if we cannot reduce the energy inputs faster than the extraction costs rise. And we actually really lack institutions and policies to even prepare for the possibility of an end to growth. And I had some additional questions, which I won't serve up, um, but maybe for the, uh, the Q&A. But number three, I think all these things, that, these problems that we talk about, and World Watch has been so focused on, here are all the problems, what do we do? I don't think we can answer what do we do until we answer what do we aspire to? 
what do humans want, not only in the next 10 years, but the next 50, the next 500, the next 1,000? Until we address that question, we're just going to be kind of uh, on a treadmill. Thank you. <laughs>